Um, next presenter is uh, Mary Jane Bupape from the, uh, from the South African Weather Service. And her presentation will concern, uh, will concern weather modeling for South Africa within the Southern Africa development community called cyber infrastructure. Just finding the clicker. Um, thank you, um, Carolina, and thank you to the organizers of the conference for inviting me to come and share with you work that we are doing within SADC. Um, and what I'll be focusing on in the talk will really be looking at, at weather modeling. Um, I, th I thought I should include the second slide here, which shows the components of the um, SADEC cyber infrastructure. So the, this is um, the framework that was approved by the ministers responsible for education, science and innovation in, in 2016. Um, the previous speaker has already spoken to um, in, you know, the early warning systems, but when it comes to weather and climate, I wanted to mention why we are beneficiaries of uh, when we look at cyber infrastructure and we rely on, on high performance computers to be able to run models with high resolution. As we run these models, as well as our observations, we produce a lot of data and we also rely on, on you know, high speed connectivity. If I'm running my model in Cape Town, I should be able to get the data here in Pretoria in a timely manner. So HCD and policies, those are two other areas that, that, that are included in the, in the framework um, that are self-explanatory. So I don't have to convince you. Um, somebody just moved the slide further. Okay, just going back to the previous slide. So I don't have to convince you that extreme weather events can have adverse impacts on, on the society. As the previous speaker has mentioned, we've heard about the floods right now in Europe, um, here in Southern Africa, we've heard about Idai tropical cyclone, uh, in 2015, 2016, we heard about the droughts that, you know, had some countries that are usually exporters of maize, um, importing maize because they did not have enough um, food to be able to feed their nations. So with these extreme events as they were okay, they don't just impact us, you know, in as far as what's happening today, but they can have some really long-term effects such that, you know, the attainment of the sustainable development goals can be impacted. For the AU Agenda 2063, actually, they mentioned climate change as as a risk factor because you know these extreme weather events can really have um, adverse. So one of the ways to try and deal with these or to to reduce the impact associated with extreme winds is to have early warning systems. Um, the state of climate in Africa, which I was looking at different events that occurred in 2019, actually. Um, also mentioned that, you know, we need multi-hazard early warning systems. Um, there are other ways, of course, to try to deal with the impacts of climate change, but early warnings are a part of um, the, the solution. So, um, when, when we look at um, weather and climate early warnings, we have um, a different components we can focus on. So there is the issue of observations. You need to have good observations to be able to have a proper early warning system. And to produce early warnings uh, or weather forecasts with a lead time that is longer than what is possible with now casting, we need to use um, um, models. And then we, we need to process the output that comes out of these models in combination with, with the observations. Then you need forecasters that can uh, that have got some experience that can interpret what comes out of the, the models and be able to issue warnings out there. Then the output can be used um, to develop um, applications for different sectors. Then there's the component of, of dissemination. So each of these components are important in their own right. But the work that I'll be talking um, about really focuses on, on the modeling. But I will also be touching on the observations because they've got an impact on, on the work that we um, with with modeling. When we started um, the work uh, 
to basically try and assist with the implementation of the SADC cyber infrastructure. We conducted a situational analysis um, of what was happening within the region. We sent out questionnaires uh, to all 16 countries, and to do this, we got the assistance of the SADC Secretariat as well as MASA, which is the Meteorological Association for Southern Africa, to send out those questionnaires. And the types of questions we were asking were to find out if the different countries were running models, if they've got now casting products, if they are running seasonal um, forecasting models, if they produce any climate change um, you know, projections, if they've got access to any remote sensing observations, in particular satellite as well as radar. We also asked about the data analysis skills that they've got available, as well as the computational resources that they had available in the different countries. So not all countries responded to our questionnaires. Uh, we received responses from, from eight countries. So our target was mostly meteorological services. So from the eight countries, we did get responses from, from the med services. Uh, we know there's other countries outside of the eight that also responded to us, but then somehow their responses um, didn't reach us. So, but we, we just went with what we had and just analyzed uh, you know, the responses that, that we got from them. Um, so just in summary, we found that in terms of numerical weather prediction, there were uh, three models that, that were used, and these models are used as downscalers. So none of the countries were running, you know, for numerical weather prediction, there were none of the countries were running global models. They were running WOF, which is uh, the previous speaker has spoken to, which is a model whose development is led in, in the the U.S. Uh, they were running Cosmo, which uh, its development is led in Germany by DWD. And um, for South Africa, we are also running the, the unified model, which was developed by, by, by the U.K. Met Office. Then in terms of seasonal forecasting, we found there was just one country being South Africa that runs a coupled, um, you know, ocean model. All the others have seasonal forecasting products, but they were running uh, statistical downscaling, which shows uh, the importance of the SACOV um, process being run by the SADC um, Secretariat. We also asked questions around the the HPC system availability and only three countries said that within the med service they've got HPC systems and those were, were South Africa, Namibia as well as as well as Tanzania. But then we knew that the cyber infrastructure framework or the HPC ecosystems project, five of the countries actually had HPC systems because of that project. And then two of the countries that had responded out of the eight actually indi indicated that they had no HPC. And through the CI process, we also knew that through the um, HPC ecosystems project, we knew they didn't have um, any um, any HPC systems. So in terms of the challenges, what we could summarize out of the situational analysis, we knew like in terms of the challenges, there were countries, a lot of them were not running any models. Uh, some were running models, but they would run a, a dynamical downscaler with a lower resolution than the global model that is forcing it. Um, in general, you could also tell that the models are being run as black boxes. Um, and then in terms of implementations for operational purposes, some of the implementations are, are made um, without any um, any testing. So the results from this situational analysis are published in the paper that you can see there, which is published in the Data Science Journal. So for us to be able to continue with, with our project, we needed some funding, and that came through the Climate Research uh, for Development Postdoctoral Fellowship. The funding is from the, the through DFID and through the, the DFID WISER program that supports Africa-led um, research, and the funding was administered by the African Academy of Science. So there were 21 of such awards and ours was one of them. And we worked on a project which we titled Improving Weather and Climate Early Warnings Over Southern Africa. We could not work with all 16 countries. We selected um, only six countries which we knew had HPC systems. And we had collaborators at NASA at the UK Met Office as well as University of Reading. And the South African government through the Department of Science and Innovation also provided some funding to also assist with, with the project. So I'm going to get to these aims with, with this. So the previous speaker has already spoken to the different models within the models, the weather models and climate models. And our approach with, with the project was actually to get different to ask different research questions. We had South Africa and Namibia asking questions about what 
happens when you change resolution. Uh, and then we had Mozambique and Tanzania comparing different convection schemes. And we had Zambia looking at different planetary boundary layer schemes and Botswana looking at different microphysics. So the idea was that the different countries, we, we look at heavy rainfall events and we ask different research, research questions. Um, with, with um, you know, so that we can get to to understand how models work better. So the way that we started was to to run a workshop. That we ran a, a first workshop in August 2019, where we had weather scientists from the six countries sitting together with the weather scientists from the med services in all the six countries, where we implemented WOF in all. Um, the HPC systems, all participating HPC systems in all these countries. Um, initially, with CR4D, we were supposed to just run for nine months. So soon after, in December, we met again where different people were then, you know, presenting on heavy rainfall events, simulations that had that that they had made on their different HPC systems. Then there was also a workshop where we had application specialists uh, meeting to talk about different applications products that that they can develop for the agromet, hydromet, energy, health, um, as well as socioeconomic benefits um, sectors. So for Botswana, as I mentioned, we looked at different microphysics schemes. Um, so the first point that I want to make is regarding a need for, for ground observations. So the very first column there shows you um, ground observations um, from the Botswana Meteorological Services. Then the second row, so these are different days. You've got 17, 18, um, as, as well as um, 19 February, we're simulating extropical cyclone um, Dineo. And the second one is the era five. So these are reanalysis that they are thought of as observations. Then the third is what we get from, from um, GPM or, or IMAX. So this is a rainfall product from NASA. Then the last line shows you TAMSAT. So all these rows there, so for each line, those are supposed to be the same thing. And these are considered all as observations. And you can see they are very different from one another. So if you want to run your model and you want to know what it is you want to simulate, if that what we consider as observations are different from each other, then it becomes a difficult process. So so anyway, as I mentioned, for Botswana, we compared four different um, microphysics schemes. So it was WSM6, WSM5, um, SB Wylin and Thompson. So these are just with microphysics schemes. I think the next speaker will speak more in detail about how they work. But in, in the end, when we say we are able to simulate clouds explicitly, the cloud microphysics schemes are the ones that are responsible for, for basically the change of phases of, of you know water vapor as well as cloud and ice in the atmosphere and the formation of clouds. So in the end, what we found from our study was just that you know the different convection schemes were generally similar to one another compared to the observations. The observations themselves, as I showed in the previous slide, were, were actually um, very different um, from, from, from each other. So I think in the end, um, a wolf has what they call sweet, and they've got a tropical sweet in it. They're using WSM6. In the end, we could say that it's OK for us to make simulations with that WSM6, but all in all, we really did not find much of a difference use when comparing different microphysics schemes. So this work is published as a preprint in the um, African Academy of Sciences um, Open Research Journal. For Zambia, we compared different um, planetary, um, um, planetary boundary layer schemes. And um, I've listed them there. We had mean, we had chem. So these are so we had both uh, schemes that are based on turbulent kinetic energy as well as non-local schemes. And we made simulations for three different events, and the heavy rainfall for each of these events was associated with a raging high pressure system which transports moisture from the Indian Ocean. Um, you know, overland, and this resulted in some heavy rainfall events. So for this study, um, again, I'm just showing you the point I made uh, for Botswana study that um, we've got, I'm showing the example for the different days. We've got IMAC, which is an observation. We've got Tamsad, different. So first date, first column is first date, second date, second column, and third date is the third column. And you can see that the, the, these observations are very different from one another. 
but then when looking at different um, planetary boundary layer schemes, we found that we got a, a larger difference in simulations when switching off the convection schemes compared to when comparing all the different um, planetary um, boundary layer schemes. Uh, but all in all, we could say the Yonsei um, University planetary bound layer scheme was the one that was recommended because when we looked at the planetary bound layer height that it produced, more reasonable com compared to the others. So this work is also published uh, in, in MDPI Climate Journal and it's, it's available for further um, details. Then for Namibia, ask the question of what happens when you switch off the convection scheme versus when, when you do not switch it off. And this is because we know that in the community, uh, when you run off, you are advised that when you start using a grid length of about three kilometers, you should switch off the convection schemes. And then there are others that say, actually, you have to be running your model at a grid length of around 100 meters to be able to switch off the convection schemes. So we just wanted to see what happens when we run you know, a model with a grid length of nine kilometers as well as three kilometers. And then sometimes we switch off this convection scheme and sometimes we do not we do not switch it off. Um, and all in all, we found that leaving the convection scheme on the particular one that we used was called TITGE scheme. Uh, we get an underestimation of rainfall intensity, and which shows to use high resolution, you we need to um, to switch off the convection scheme when you get to, to higher resolution. Otherwise, you are going to use the the extreme rainfall events. So that I've got there in red is the point where rainfall actually, or there was over 50 millimeters of rainfall that was observed um, in Namibia for, for that particular event. And when we make simulations where we switch on the convection scheme, it doesn't matter if we use multi-nesting, multi-nesting by multi-nesting. I mean, we, we nest wharf with a grid length of nine kilometers and within that we nest again with, with three kilometers. We did not find much of a difference um, when looking at the different uh, nesting techniques, but switching of the convection scheme actually resulted in, in, in um, bigger differences. Um, so that work from Namibia is also is also published in, in climate. Then for for Mozambique, we, we compared um, a different convection schemes. We con compared five different convection schemes, and we also made simulations where the convection scheme was, was switched off. And for this, we selected schemes that we knew, as far as we know, are not scale-aware, and we also selected schemes that we know are scale-aware. And by scale-aware, I mean that as you increase the resolution, the scheme is supposed to adjust um, the way that it operates. We made them into to our simulations for, for the Idai tropical cyclone. And when looking at 24-hour rainfall, we found there was not much of a difference uh, when comparing the different simulations. Um, but then when we partition the rainfall into the rainfall that is resolved versus the rainfall that is um, simulated by the convection scheme, we found that the scale aware ones, which you see there uh, with the title of GREL F as well as MSKF, actually produced less rainfall compared to the ones less rainfall from the convection scheme compared to the ones that are not scale aware. And this showed us that as you go to higher resolution, perhaps it might be best um, to go for for these types of, of, of schemes. But then we found that the, there were challenges. So if the model that you are using does not capture um, you know, the dynamic process as well, uh, the dynamical downscalers will also not do a very good job at that. The paper on this study has been accepted um, in atmosphere and will be appearing in, in the next um, few days. So for South Africa, we did a study where we tried to look at um, um, we, it, I guess, that tropical cyclone, but for this, we were looking at the operational systems that we have got available, and we were asking questions around whether the models were able to capture the event and what was the information that the forecasters um, sent out. So this year, I'm just showing you an example of what can uh, weather service produced were a regional specialized meteorological center, which means we've got responsibilities not just for South Africa, but for SADC, we can provide information which forecasters, which forecasters can use. And here I'm just showing you that from South Africa, there were there was an indication from the models that we are looking at that Idai was going to make landfall um, over the Beira area on 14 March in 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 
2019. And the South and African flash flood guidance was also available for people in Mozambique as well as in, in Zimbabwe and Malawi to use to warn the public of, of um, where flooding was going to take place. For South Africa, we compared the performance of the ECMWF model, um, the IFS model, as well as the unified model in simulating a flooding event that happened over South Africa. And for this one, we actually found that the ECMWF did better in capturing the exact location where the flooding occurred. And this work we've also published um, in the South African Journal of Science. So we've also done some work where we looked at the performance of the unified model um, in simulating a thunderstorm, a severe thunderstorm event that resulted in a tornado. That tornado caused a lot of damage, um, and we found that the um, the lower resolution model, basically, which is a grid length of four kilometers, managed to capture the the event somehow, and then the higher resolution model did not capture that. So. Uh, well, as, as I conclude um, my presentation to talk about the issue of human capital development, we ran a training program um, in February of 2021 where you know, we wanted to make some, you know, teach on Linux, on, on Fortran, uh, as well as on, on Python. And we sent out an advert for that training workshop before we ran it. And we, we sent the advert to seven countries and we had a lot of responses in the end, over 100 people that were registered, and as I mentioned, within a short space of time. And for us, this shows us that there are a lot of people that are available. So as the infrastructure gets rolled out, it is important, um, you know, that there, there are mechanisms for us to train people that can use this infrastructure. As we say, no data should become available, should be accessible. They, it is important that, you know, there are mechanisms to make sure that people um, get trained on the use of, of these data sets. I think with that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop, um, Carolina. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think we have time for one very, very quick question. Uh, are there any questions? Um, okay. Um, I cannot see any question on the chat, but uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, your country, uh, South African Weather Service, exactly, uh, is also engaging the development of unified model and uh, we are partners. I mean, we, uh, my, my unit, University of Warsaw and uh, South African Weather Service, uh, we are the partners in the consortium. So uh, we cooperate on the, on the unified model. Um, uh, I have one question. Uh, who are the participants in the workshops? Okay, so, so uh, well, thanks for, for, for that question. Um, so for, for the workshop, because the previous the, the first workshop that we held, the idea was to implement WOF onto the HPC systems. So we got HPC specialists from the six countries that were participating in the project, as well as weather scientists from the different countries. From each country, we made sure that there was at least one person. From we had more more participants from from South Africa as well as from Botswana. From Botswana, it was because the Botswana was willing to send more people. Uh, and then in our case, we only had to provide them with accommodation. But for all the other countries, we had an HPC specialist as well as a weather scientist sitting together to, to implement um, WOF onto these different systems. Um, then we also had a, an applications workshops, which as I mentioned, we had different application specialists. So for those, we had people that specialize in energy, um, but for all of these, because we were limited with our funding, so we had to select one application area per country. Um, so maybe just a comment on, on, on the unified model. Indeed, we, we are a UM partner and we, we use the UM as the main operational model at the South African Weather Service. <laughs>